Hello class, welcome to your fourth and final installment for the digestive system. For, e for these last few slides, we're focusing on the accessory digestive organs. In particular, right now up on the screen, you're seeing a picture of the liver. The liver, according to my physiology book that I utilize for the physiology students, performs over 500 functions. I can't even, I'm hard pressed to name 10. It stores vitamins, it helps process fats, it stores glucose in the form of glycogen. It can even turn amino acids into new glucose. That's a process called gluconeogenesis. It detoxifies our blood from poisons and drugs. It helps make blood proteins, in particular albumin, just to name a few. Our focus for the liver as a, an accessory digestive organ will be its role in bile production. Bile is not a chemical enzyme. Bile does not digest anything. It merely emulsifies fats. And what does that mean? It means when you ingest fat, this large fat droplet needs to be chemically broken down by an enzyme called lipase. However, if you think of a large fat droplet, then the lipase doesn't have a lot of surface area to get to the chemical bonds to hydrolyze them. So bile takes this large fat droplet and reduces it to many smaller fat droplets to increase the surface area for lipase to do its job. The bile contains in it some cholesterol and bile salts, and I will talk about how these bile salts can precipitate out of solution and lead to a gallstone. The apex of the liver, which means its most superior portion, would lie at the level of your left nipple. And I mean your left natural nipple, not your, the level of your nipple if you're an 83-year-old woman, because then your nipple is down to your um, um, umbilical region. So your liver doesn't sink along with your boobs, guys and ladies. I mean the natural level of your left nipple. That's how high up your liver is. There is a entrance into and an exit out of the liver, and this is called the porta hepatis, shown here on the right side picture. In the porta hepatis, we see a branch of the hepatic artery entering into the liver, brings blood to the liver to bring nutrients to the hepatocytes. The hepatocytes are the cells in the liver that do all of these 500 functions that I just listed for you. There is also the right and left hepatic ducts. These are going to carry bile out of the liver. They fuse to form the common hepatic duct, which can then join to the cystic duct, which leads to the gallbladder. And eventually the cystic duct and the common hepatic duct, when they do merge, they can form the bile duct. And this is called your biliary apparatus, and I will talk about that more. The hepatic portal vein is also bringing blood into the lung. This is carrying nutrients that have recently been absorbed from the stomach and intestines, and they're bringing them into the liver for detoxification before being distributed to the rest of the cells of the body. Let's look at the gross anatomy of the liver. The liver is composed of four incompletely separated lobes supported by two ligaments. The major lobes are the right and left lobe. The right lobe is separated from the smaller left lobe by the falciform ligament, a peritoneal fold that secures the liver to the anterior abdominal wall. In the inferior free edge of the falciform ligament lies the round ligament of the liver, or ligamentum teres. Remember, this was a remnant or is a remnant of the fetal umbilical vein. Subdivisions of the right lobe include the caudate lobe, cauda means tail, and quadrate, quadratus means square, lobe. The caudate lobe is adjacent to the inferior vena cava, and the quadrate lobe is adjacent to the gallbladder, as shown in this picture. Take some time to orient yourself to these two pictures on the screen. 
The bottom picture shows the liver flipped upside down so you can see inside. Orient yourself for the quadrate. Think of quadrate as four sides. It looks like a perfect square in this picture versus the caudate, which looks more elongated like a tail. Along the inferior surface of the liver are several structures that collectively represent the letter H. The gallbladder and the round ligament of the liver form the vertical superior parts of the H. The inferior vena cava and the ligamentum venosum form the vertical inferior parts. Remember, ligamentum venosum is a remnant of the ductus venosus of our, the embryo. We learn this as uh, part of the embryonic blood flow. Remember that? Finally, the porta hepatis, like I told you on the previous slide, represents the horizontal crossbar of the H, and this is where blood and lymph vessels, bile ducts, and nerves enter and leave the liver. On the next slide, we're going to continue on to the histology of the liver. Where the liver attaches inferiorly to the diaphragm, the peritoneum cannot go over the top of the liver. And therefore, there is a diaphragmatic end or bare area where no visceral peritoneum goes over the liver. We do have models in the lab that show this bare area, and you're going to want to make sure you see it because it is oftentimes tagged on your lab exam. Now let's focus on the histology of the liver. The uh, connective tissue capsule branches through the liver and forms septa. These are walls. They partition the liver into thousands of small polyhedral hepatic lobules. So the functional unit of the liver is called a lobule. Now a lobule we were able to see without a microscope on the surface of the lung. In the liver you would need a microscope to see the hepatic lobules. And again, your lab exam is going to ask you what is the functional unit of the liver. You're going to want to mark hepatic lobules. They look like hexagons in this picture. Within the hepatic lobules are liver cells called hepatocytes. At the periphery of each lobule are several portal triads. Look at the bottom right picture. You'll see a portal triad. It consists of a branch of a bile duct, the branch of a hepatic portal vein, and a branch of the hepatic artery. You will be tested on a portal triad and what components you find in it, both in your lab exam and in your lecture 7 exam. Be ready for that. A dual blood supply serves the liver. The hepatic portal vein carries blood from the capillary beds of the GI tract, spleen, and pancreas. It brings about 75% of the blood volume to the liver. This blood is rich in nutrients and other absorbed substances, but relatively poor in oxygen. This blood is going to the liver for the sake of the hepatocytes to cleanse this blood. The hepatic artery proper, which is a branch of the celiac trunk, splits into the left and right hepatic arteries. These arteries are carrying well oxygenated blood to the liver rich with nutrients. This blood is serving the needs of the hepatocytes. Blood from branches of the hepatic arteries and hepatic portal vein mix as it passes to and through the hepatic lobules. At the center of each lobule is a central vein that drains the blood from the lobule. Central veins collect venous blood and merge throughout the liver to form numerous hepatic veins that eventually empty into the inferior vena cava. I want to remind you that the hepatic portal vein is part of a portal system. Remember, a double capillary bed in tandem. In this cross section, we see a hepatic lobule and a side view. It sort of looks like a uh, bicycle wheel. The hub of the wheel is the central vein. At the circumference of the wheel where the tire would be, are several portal triads that are usually equidistant apart. The numerous spokes of the wheel are the hepatic sinusoids. And you can see that here um, as the blue lines uh, or blue veins. Uh, they are draining blood towards the central vein. 
Hepatic sinusoids are bordered by cords of hepatocytes. These cells have easy access to the blood flowing within the hepatic sinusoids. And they, these hepatic sinusoids, to remind you, are a modified capillary bed with huge gapes in the endothelial lining to allow easy access by the hepatocytes to the blood inside. These sinusoids are thin-walled, porous, or leaky capillaries, like I just said. <coughs> capillaries, like I just said, where venous and arterial blood are mixed and then flow slowly through the hepatic lobule toward the central vein. The sinusoids are also lined with special cells called reticuloendothelial cells, or Kupfer cells, as sometimes they're called. These are phagocytic cells. They're really macrophages that are performing an immune function for us. The hepatocytes absorb nutrients from the sinusoids. They also produce bile, a greenish fluid that breaks down fats. Again, not chemical breakdown, but reducing large fat droplets into smaller ones. And this will assist the lipase in chemical digestion. And then finally, between each cord of hepatocytes, there is a small bile canaliculus. Bile canaliculi conduct bile from the hepatocytes to the bile duct in the portal triad. Attached to the inferior surface of the liver, a sac-like organ called the gallbladder concentrates bile produced by the liver and stores this concentrate until it is needed for digestion. The cystic duct connects the gallbladder to the common bile duct. The gallbladder can hold about 40 to 60 milliliters of concentrated bile. The gallbladder has three regions, neck, body, and fundus. I will show you a better picture of the neck, body, and fundus in a few more slides. At the neck of the gallbladder, a sphincter valve controls the flow of bile into and out of the gallbladder. It's weird to think of into and out. You see bile constantly drips through the right and left hepatic ducts into the common hepatic duct, which then flows into the cystic duct, as well as the bile duct. There's a sphincter down towards the major duodenal papilla, which is constricted, and the bile dams up. And bile, as the bile dams up in the bile duct, it will backwards flow into the cystic duct and be stored in the gallbladder. When all of these sphincters relax, then the bile can flow through these ducts, out of the gallbladder, through the ducts, and into your duodenum, where it can then emulsify fat. The gallbladder has uh, tunics. It has an inner mucosa. It has a middle muscularis to cause contraction to expel the bile, and an external serosa. The folds within the mucosa allow the gallbladder to distend. If you do not eat fat on a regular basis, the gallbladder will actually reduce how much bile it stores. And when you next eat a lot of fat, you might not have enough bile to emulsify the fat that you've just eaten. Your gallbladder will, will contract very strongly, and you'll have um, painful abdominal cramps and you won't be able to then emulsify the fat that you just ate. The lipase won't be able to digest it, and you will have steatorrhea, which means fatty diarrhea. And your diarrhea looks like it's a, a salad oil dressing, and all of your diarrhea will look like uh, fat droplets floating on the surface of the water. When the bile salts uh, precipitate, they can form gallstones, this is from too much cholesterol or bile salts that lead to the crystallization of the cholesterol. This can plug the cystic duct and can be very, very painful when the gallbladder is trying to contract and overcome that blockage. High concentrations, like I said, of certain materials in the bile can lead to the formation of gallstones. Gallstone, gallstone formation occurs twice as frequently in women as in men and are more prevalent in developed countries because of our high-fat diet. Obesity, increasing age, female sex hormones, Caucasian ethnicity, 
and lack of physical activity are all risk factors for developing gallstones. The term cholelithiasis refers to the presence of gallstones in either the gallbladder or the biliary apparatus. I will show you what that is in a moment. Gallstones are typically formed from condensations of either cholesterol, like I said, or calcium and bile salts. These stones can vary from the tiniest grains to structures almost the size of golf balls. The majority of gallstones are asymptomatic until a gallstone becomes lodged in the neck of the cystic duct, causing the gallbladder to become inflamed. That's called cholecystitis, and it becomes dilated as well. The most common symptom is severe pain, called biliary colic, perceived in the right hypochondriac region, that means right below your ribs, or sometimes in the area of the right shoulder. Nausea and vomiting may occur, along with indigestion and bloating. Now, why do you think the referred pain would be in the right shoulder? Just to remind you, many of our abdominal contents were first embryonically formed in much more superior positions. Symptoms are typically worse after eating a fatty meal, again, because the gallbladder starts to spasm trying to expel the bile. Treatment can consist of surgical removal of the gallbladder called a cholecystectomy. Following surgery, the liver will continue to produce bile, even in the absence of the gallbladder, but there is no means of concentrating the bile, so further gallstones are unlikely. And the person is advised to have a low-fat diet because if they eat too much fat, because you can't store the bile, it's just constantly dripping out of the liver and just accumulating the bile duct, you might not have enough to emulsify your fats. And again, you can have this, the fatty diarrhea called steatorrhea. To remind you from a previous segment, the regulation of release of bile from the, gall, the, from the gallbladder is under the control of a hormone called cholecystokinin. Cholecystokinin targets the gallbladder to release bile. It also targets the pancreas to release pancreatic digestive enzymes. Speaking of the pancreas, let's now look at this anatomical relationship between the common bile duct. Sometimes it's called the common bile duct. Sometimes it's just called the bile duct. The common bile duct forms from the uh, the cystic duct combining with the common hepatic duct. I'll show you this on the next slide. It's part of the biliary apparatus. These different ducts and how they merge to form different ducts will be heavily tested upon in your lab unit 4 as well as your lecture unit 7. In this picture you're seeing the duodenum, that, that kind of C-like structure it takes as it curves around the head of the pancreas. The pancreas has the head, it has the body and then the tail. The pancreas is considered to be a mixed gland. It has both exocrine and endocrine functions. The exocrine function is 98% of its function. The endocrine functions are performed by the islets of Langerhans or pancreatic islets. We learned those in our endocrine system. We learned about insulin and we learned about glucagon. The exocrine activity includes the production and secretion of digestive enzymes and bicarbonate rich juice, both of these collectively called pancreatic juice. And they are secreted through the pancreatic duct. There's a main pancreatic duct and sometimes there's an accessory pancreatic duct. And these secretions are released through the major duodenal papilla. There's a band of smooth muscle going around the papilla called the hepatopancreatic ampulla. When that muscle contracts, that sphincter is closed off, pancreatic juices dam up in the pancreas, and bile juices dam up in the common bile duct. When that sphincter releases, then all these secretions can go out into the duodenum. Again, the pancreas has a head, a body, and a tail. The digestive portion, or the exocrine portion of the pancreas, is performed by cells, simple cuboidal cells, called acinar cells. 
These cells, which are organized into large clusters termed acini, the singular form is acinus, or lobules, and they secrete mucin and the digestive enzymes of the pancreas. And I will list all of the digestive enzymes for you shortly. These cells line the pancreatic ducts, and they also secrete bicarbonate-rich fluid. This is going to help neutralize the acidic chyme arriving in the duodenum from the stomach. Most of the pancreatic juice travels through ducts that merge to form the main pancreatic duct, <clears throat> like I show you on this picture, which then in turn drains into the major duodenal papilla found in the duodenum. A smaller accessory pancreatic duct drains a small amount of pancreatic juice into a minor duodenal papilla in the duodenum. Both hormonal and neural mechanisms control pancreatic juice secretions. Enteroendocrine cells in the intestinal glands release cholecystokinin to promote the secretion of pancreatic juices from acinar cells, specifically the digestive enzymes. Secretin in turn, stimulates the release of the alkaline fluid from the pancreatic duct cells, and this is required to neutralize those stomach acids. Remember, most enzymes of your body are optimal at a body pH of 7.40. We saw an anomaly in the stomach with pepsin. When the chyme is released from the stomach, we need the pancreatic alkaline bicarbonate-rich juice to neutralize the stomach acid and bring the pH back up to 7.40 so that the pancreatic enzymes are functional and can do their chemical digestion. Again, the pancreas has mostly an exocrine function. I say on the slide 90% uh, function, but in our physiology book it says it's 98% exocrine in function. Regardless, most of the pancreas is exocrine by nature, creating digestive enzymes as well as bicarbonate-rich fluid. The enzymes released by the pancreas will be zymogens. That means they are inactive and need to be activated. What activates them? Well, an enzyme released by intestinal glands called enterokinase, which I've already presented in an earlier segment, will activate the, the pancreatic zymogens into active enzymes. Many of the pancreatic enzymes are going to be involved in protein digestion. Cells are filled with proteins. You don't want your digestive enzymes active inside a cell. You will digest yourself. And when that happens in the pancreas, when it erroneously happens, it is extremely painful and that's called pancreatitis. The patient who is admitted to the hospital for pancreatitis should be looking to stay there for about 10 days to two weeks. Once these digestive enzymes get going, it's very difficult to stop them. I will talk about acute and chronic pancreatitis at the end of this lecture. Very little of the pancreas is endocrine in function. You're seeing in the top left picture little islands of lightly staining cells. These are your pancreatic islets that have your alpha cells and beta cells. And remember from unit six, these cells are making hormones. Beta cells make insulin, which helps insert glucose transporters so that your blood glucose levels can be lowered. Glucagon is made by alpha cells this stimulates the liver to release blood um, uh, glucose into the blood during times in between meals. Delta cells release a hormone called somatostatin, and this inhibits digestion and reabsorption, or absorption, I should say, in the digestive tract. This picture on the bottom left is showing your biliary apparatus you're seeing that there are left and right hepatic ducts that merge to form the common hepatic duct. The bile can continuously drift down from the common hepatic duct to the common bile duct. The common bile duct is formed by the common hepatic duct and the cystic duct. 
the bile drips down, and if and when the hepatopancreatic ampulla is constricted, the bile will dam up in the common bile duct and backwards into the cystic duct and be stored in the gallbladder. And in this picture, you can see the fundus, the body, and the neck of the gallbladder. When the hepatic ampulla relaxes, bile can drip through the cystic duct, back through the common bile duct, and out through the major duodenal papilla and into the duodenum. Here is a table of the enzymes released by the pancreas as well as the bicarbonate rich juice which serves to neutralize the hydrochloric acid from the stomach. These enzymes are very specific, meaning substrate specific. I'm going to go over them, <sighs> well, not so quickly. If you print up this slide, print up this slide from the PowerPoint as a notes pages, you can follow along with my transcript. First of all, there are DNA and RNA enzymes. These enzymes are going to digest RNA and DNA that are found in the cells you just ate. Meat cells, apple cells, they all have DNA and RNA. DNases, RNases can only hydrolyze the bonds in between the individual nucleotides. Again, all of these enzymes are substrate specific. A DNase can only digest DNA. It cannot digest, digest fat. A lipase can do that. When these enzymes hydrolyze bonds, that means they are breaking the bonds by bringing back a water molecule. Water is your molecular scissor. All of these enzymes break down the individual bonds through hydrolysis and liberate monomers. What's the monomer of an RNA? A nucleotide. What's the monomer of DNA? A nucleotide. What's the monomer of proteins? Amino acids. Pancreatic lipase will hydrolyze fats into free fatty acids and glycerides. Pancreatic amylase is going to hydrolyze carbohydrates such, such as starch into simple sugars. There are three pancreatic enzymes for protein digestion. They are called trypsinogen, chymotrypsinogen, and procarboxypeptidase. Again, these are zymogens released in an inactive form. Enterokinase will activate trypsinogen into trypsin, chymotrypsinogen into chymotrypsin, and procarboxypeptidase becomes carboxypeptidase. All three of these enzymes will digest the proteins you've just ingested. I like this slide, even though it's not from your textbook. It again shows you the substrate specificity for all of the digestive enzymes I have taught you. It also organizes where carbohydrate digestion begins and continues in your gut, as well as protein digestion. We see starch digestion beginning in the mouth with salivary amylase. It does not continue in the stomach, but carbohydrate digestion will continue in the small intestine with, with the release of pancreatic amylases. In the brush border, you also learned that there are enzymes like lactase and sucrase and maltase that can digest those simple sugars into even smaller sugars. For protein digestion, we see protein digestion begin in the stomach, thanks to pepsin, and continues in the small intestine through the release of pancreatic enzymes, as well as enzymes found in the brush border from the small intestine. Not shown on this slide, but released by the pancreas are enzymes for DNA digestion, RNA digestion, and fat digestion from pancreatic lipase. If you do not have function of your pancreas, the brush border enzymes from the intestinal cells are not enough for good chemical breakdown. If you have pancreatic failure, 
you will not be able to break down your macromolecules as completely as you should, and you will have diarrhea. You will have steatorrhea from the fat that you could not break down, and you could not then absorb it, as well as diarrhea that has a lot of protein and carbohydrates that were not broken down. If you cannot break down your macromolecules into your monomers, the intestinal mucosa and the cells there with the, the membrane transport cannot absorb these nutrients. You have to get them really, really small to the monomers for the membrane transport to absorb the nutrients. Otherwise, it comes out as diarrhea. If your pancreas inflames, this is called pancreatitis. This means you are now digesting your own pancreas because the trypsinogen and chymotrypsinogen and procarboxypeptidase have now autocatalyzed themselves into active enzymes. Acute pancreatitis usually is attributed to a gallstone blocking the pancreatic duct. Again, the pancreatic enzymes autocatalyze themselves into an active form and you start to digest, of your, digest yourself. You know exactly where you are when this process starts. The pain is that remarkable. Chronic pancreatitis is attributed mostly to alcohol abuse. We do not know why chronic alcohol abuse leads to pancreatitis. We know that there is an anatomical and physiologic relationship between the liver and the pancreas. Think of the biliary apparatus. What signals are being released from the liver to target the pancreas? We don't know that yet. We just do know that there is this relationship. Again, once the person starts the autodigestive process, that patient will likely be in the hospital easily 10 to 2 weeks before these digestive enzymes are under control again. A person who has another bout of pancreatitis that leads to chronic, if they have two or three episodes of pancreatitis within a year, that's now called chronic pancreatitis. The person is not long for this world if they cannot get their alcohol abuse under control. Peptic ulcer disease, again, peptic ulcers occur when damaging effects of acid and pepsin overcome the mucosa to protect itself. Gastric ulcers occur in the stomach. Duodenal ulcers occur in the duodenum. Gastric ulcers, when they present, is usually uh, a decreased ability for the gastric mucosa to protect itself. Maybe it's lost its tight junctions or epithelial replacement. Or maybe the person is taking aspirin every day. The aspirin targets the mucosa neck cells and they are impaired with making that bicarbonate rich mucus. And therefore now the cells are not protected by that bicarbonate rich mucus and the acid starts to erode the simple columnar cells. Duodenal ulcers, in contrast, the main problem is from exposure to increased amounts of acid and pepsin. Maybe the person is making too much acid. Uh, acid is stimulated for release by your parietal cells through either direct nervous stimulation by parasympathetic fibers or the submucosal plexus, two, hormone, as in gastrin, and three, local chemical signals. Uh, when the mucosa starts to become inflamed and damaged, it releases histamine, and that can lead to more uh, stimulation of the parietal cells to release even more acid. So that's a catch-22. When the mucosa becomes inflamed, it re because of acid touching it, it leads to histamine release, which in turn leads to even more acid. It's, it's, a, it's a positive feedback cycle. It's a vicious cycle. Most peptic ulcers are actually attributed, of all things, if we rule out stress, smoking, and alcohol abuse, and NSAID abuse, the most number one caus causative agent is H. pylori, or Helicobacter pylori. These are bacteria that have, can withstand the very acidic contents of the stomach. 
They have a urease activity. You will learn more about this in physiology. And once we identify the cause, if it is H. pylori, we can give the patient antibiotics and antacids, and this should help abate the ulcer. If we cannot stop the ulcer <coughs> from getting worse, it can lead to a <coughs> excuse me, a lesion that actually breaks through all the layers of the mucosae down to the submucosae, and blood vessels then bleed into the stomach. Blood accumulating in the stomach and even in the small intestine will become digested. This can lead to vomiting or diarrhea, and we can see blood in the stool or in the vomitus. If the blood has been digested, we, uh, the blood, when it's vomited, will look like coffee grounds. If we see blood digested in the stool, this is called melina, and it looks thick, black, and tarry. This is important because if you stop and ask your patient, are you vomiting blood or do you have blood in your stool, what color do you usually think of with blood? Red, right? But if the blood has been there for a while and has been chemically digested down by the enzymes released by the pancreas and or stomach, blood will not look occult or red anymore. It'll look either black and tarry in the stool, and this is called melina, or it'll look like coffee grounds in the vomitus. All right, this concludes our digestive system discussion for anatomy. Boy, that was a long lecture. Thanks for paying attention.